people out there. Uh, welcome to WonderCon 2021 and welcome to the Writer's Coffee House. Uh, for those of you who have not done one of these before, either in person as we used to do them back in the day or a virtual one, uh, basically the Writer's Coffee House began years ago with another writer named Jonathan Mabry. Um, Jonathan basically realized that he was teaching a class and afterwards, you know, a bunch of students would sort of follow the teachers out, the different writers, and ask follow-up questions on related questions, and they'd all go out and get coffee, get a drink or something. And eventually, you know, 10 or 5 or 10 students would follow, 10 or 20 students would follow, the whole class would go out and follow up. And Jonathan realized people got just as much out of a sort of informal sitting around talking about stuff as they did out of a much more regimented lecturing to a class. Um, and so that's how the Writer's Coffee House begun. Uh, Jonathan's been doing it for a little over 10 years. When he moved out to California, he convinced me to start one in Los Angeles, which I'm still doing in Dark Delicacies. Uh, not obviously in the past year, but. Um, and that's how I go. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, I am Peter Kleins. I am the author of Paradox Bound, The Threshold Books, The X Heroes Books, some other random stuff. Um, everybody want to do a quick intro and we'll get going. Steven, who are you? I'm Steven, in case right. you didn't realize that. Right on my screen, Peter's over there. I don't know what anybody else is seeing or how this is going to show up. So I'm Stephen Steven Blackmore. That's, it's, it's like the Brady Bunch. You know, we're all in our little boxes. I'm Stephen Blackmore. Uh, I'm an author. And like everybody else in on this panel. And uh, I write an urban fantasy series uh, about a necromancer in Los Angeles. And that's it. Sir, I have I have nothing else that <laughs> defines me. That will be Stephen's contribution to the panel, Sarah. <laughs> I don't know how I can top that. Um, I'm Sarah Kuhn, and I write novels and comic books, and probably best known for a series called Heroin Complex, which is a series of novels about Asian American superheroines and their many adventures. Um, I also write a lot of licensed things. I wrote a graphic novel called Shadow of the Batgirl that was about Cassandra Kane uh, with artist Nicole Gu, and I wrote a Star Wars audiobook about Dr. Afra, who is awesome. And I also write uh, young adult rom-coms. The next one coming out is called From Little Tokyo with Love, and it is set in Los Angeles's beautiful Little Tokyo neighborhood, which I have not really been able to visit very much in the past year, but it is still be beautiful and wonderful and definitely worthy of writing a book about. So those are some things that I do. Great. Great. I think we're waiting on you, Peter. Uh, oh, <laughs> I heard my name. I'm just going to go. Uh, I'm Greg Van Eekout. I write science fiction and fantasy, um, some for adults, some for middle grade audiences. Uh, most recently, um, these two books with cute covers. They give me the cutest covers. And uh, forthcoming. Books? Yeah, you were supposed to have books. Too. <laughs> and, uh, I got us a wall. But, uh, next coming out is a book called Weird Kid in July. It's also a little great. I'm done. And, <laughs> and Fonda. Hi, everyone. I'm Fonda Lee. I also write science fiction and fantasy. I'm probably best well known for the Greenbone Saga, which starts with uh, Jade City and its sequel, Jade War. And the third book, Jade Legacy, comes out this year. It's an epic urban fantasy trilogy that I have described as the godfather with magic and kung fu. I'm also the author of uh, three young adult science fiction novels, a duology, um, Exo and Crossfire, and um, Zero Boxer, which is a standalone. And I have a smattering of comics and short fiction out there as well. Cool. Um, so we have a couple questions. And Fonda, since you're already talking, I'm going to throw the first one to you first. Uh, this one is actually the last one I got, and I, I think I know what, sp what spurned it with someone, but what is voice? Everybody talks about this, but I don't understand what it is. How do you have your own voice, but sound like other people? So I think there is two aspects to voice, and um, at least two. Uh, for me, there is the voice of the novel, and there's also the voice of you as an author. So at any given time, I may be working on a project and trying to cultivate a particular voice for that story. Uh, so for example, with the Greenbone Saga, which is an adult fantasy series, um, but also has very strong elements of 
um, of kind of crime drama family saga um, there it has that series has a particular voice that I'm trying to achieve there's a certain there's a there's a um, very sort of stark tone to it um, a certain amount of emotional distance uh, using an omnipresent POV um, because I'm moving between a cast of characters uh, so um, part of voice is the emotional uh, tone, mood, um, atmosphere that you're trying to create for a story. And then on a broader level, there is what is your author voice, like across your body of work? What is your, what, who are you? Um, and what's your, uh, you know, like what, what feels, I guess, the most natural and that you want to kind of cultivate as something that is part of, for lack of a better word, you know, your author brand. And you can move between different voices and different projects, but there's still something about you inherently um, that is you know, your, you as an author that carries through all of your work. And I think that's something that's hard to define because for most writers, certainly for me, you develop it gradually and you can't, there's really no shortcut to developing it other than to write more and more. When you start out, I think this is true for a lot of writers, you find stuff that you admire and you're trying to kind of copy it or um, bring it into your own voice. So I found when I was a, when I was an early writer, I would read, you know, something that was uh, very, um, very like sharpened and, and had all these, all this like great imagery. And I would like try to like write like that, or I'd write, find something that was lyrical and poetic and I try to write that. And so you're kind of trying on different clothes when you're an early career author. And over time you settle into something that just feels like you, that feels natural and that, um, that you, you, you become known for. And so it's hard to even say like, this is my voice because it's something that other people will gradually come to recognize as you become more experienced and you have a greater body of work. I like that answer. Anyone want to tag on, add on, slightly alternate view? Um, Stephen? Not necessarily alternate, but uh, your point about gradually uh, developing a voice for years, I would try to emulate uh, authors that I read a lot of at the time. And it was, you know, everything's in past tense, everything's uh, written, there's, there's a lot of lyrical, to use your word, uh, description and all that, could never get it going. And then I picked up a noir novel, and it's called Kiss Me Judas. And there's no quotation marks in it. There's really short sentences. And it's very vivid. I, I saw that and went, okay, wait a minute. This is, this is it. And I find myself going back to that book to kind of get a refresher on what I was trying to do and then kind of comparing it to what has that, what has my voice turned into? Because now it's, there's very little connection. There's some structural things, some things that, you know, in how I write, but it's very clear, at least to me, that that is way off the uh, uh, off the road from where I'm at now. Um, yeah, just kind of, just kind of with the uh, the development of of voice, whatever you're trying, and over time, you know, mine's changed. I think also. Um, there's a, and I've heard this before, of um, plot authors and voice authors. And those people who are very good at, at uh, staging their stories and, and other people who are, you read it and go, yes, I know who this is. I know what this is. And it's a very clear cut you know that that's a voice. Um, one of the examples I heard on that was uh, Dashiell Hammett for the plot and Raymond Chandler for the voice. But 
they don't they don't really you know i mean hammett's voice is is dull and chandler's plots are indecipherable um but that kind of thing so seeing something like that um kind of drives home to me uh what voice is um so I am someone who has been called, I think, a, a voice writer or a voicey writer or whatever that's that's referred to. Um, and I think it's interesting because I do feel like with most of my work, it's they're they're obviously very different from each other. You know, I have some things with magic and some things where it's just like people being cute and you know going around and eating fun food and stuff like that. But I think that you can always tell um that it is written by me um i think sometimes it sounds like you know i am speaking to you for 300 straight pages which is an, an experience you may find enjoyable and you may not um but i think this is something where there are actually two things that i might suggest if this is something you feel like um you're struggling with a little bit one is i think at the beginning don't overthink it too much um a lot of times like what comes out like what just comes out naturally and seems to be like sort of a key attribute to your writing, that will be sort of the thing that uh, Fonda and Stephen talked about where it develops as you go on, as you write more and more and eventually becomes your voice. But I wouldn't necessarily try to math that too much, I guess, or try to put it into some kind of equation or some kind of like, if I just apply these certain elements and these certain you know bits of craft, my, my voice will magically appear. I think you have to remember that your voice is something that actually comes from within you. It's that sort of thing that you do that presumably no one else can. Um, so I would, one, like try to think of it in a more natural way of like, you know, what is what is actually just coming out of me is like, I'm trying to tell this story and trying to develop this story. Um, and then the other thing is um, a lot of times the voice will come from the character you're writing. I really liked what Fonda said about how you have kind of the voice of you, the writer, and the voice of the novel. And since I write a lot of kind of first person, you know, very in the moment, fast paced, um, whatever that character is, tends to be the central voice of the book. Um, you know, in my first Y rom-com and I Love You So Mochi, the character was very sweet and dreamy and you know she kind of went on these like flights of fancy and she was like very nice for the most part and um, the character in from little tokyo with love is very grouchy um so it's very different you know she has a very cynical approach of life and a cynical approach to life the way she looks at people is maybe a little bit different than the character in the other book um so you can also look at character as sort of something that will help guide that for you. And as you're building that character, a lot of times their voice will naturally emerge combined with whatever you know, you're know you bringing to it that's so unique. Um, and then I will also say that like to talking about voice writers versus plot writers, usually when I start writing something, I'm like plot, I do not know her. Um, I don't know what's happening, but I do know what this person sounds like. Um, so I think like if you sort of lean into naturally what's coming out and try to look at it from the perspective of who is this character and how would they say this sort of filtered through me as the author, those can be good starting points. Greg, you got it. Uh, I, well, I'm just gonna echo what Sarah said. I really like what Sarah said about letting it flow naturally and uh, not worrying about it too much. I would say when in your first draft, open the valve wide and let whatever comes out of you come come out of you. If you uh, want to do humorous asides, whether or not you think it's appropriate to the story, do that humorous aside. If you want to have some dry info dumps, do that. It's on the next drafts where you're going to read it back and you're going to actually now perceive what came out and you're going to pick like the parts of that voice that feel most natural and appropriate to that story. And then you can sharpen that and you can carve everything away and what's left will be your voice. It's very difficult to find your voice in your first 20 years of writing. It's gonna develop naturally and it's gonna to continue to evolve. It's a really difficult thing to do deliberately, I feel. I, I had someone explain it to me once that voice is like telling a joke that if say all five of us were given the same joke to tell, we would all tell it slightly differently and when we're writing a book, it's a 300 page joke or a 300 page romance, but, but that's it that, you know, you telling the story and me telling the story and him telling the story and her telling the story, we're all going to tell that story a little differently. And, and that is our voice shining through. And like everyone says, it's not a deliberate thing that we're going to start off. I'm, I'm going to tell all my jokes the same way George Carlin tells jokes. 
or Pat Oswald or John Mulaney or you know somebody. Um, but eventually we start telling jokes our own way and we start telling stories our own way. And in the same way that uh, the easy one, we can all tell a Stephen King book when we pick it up. But not only that, if we hear, oh, Stephen King's doing a book about werewolves, Frankenstein, whatever, we can all sense what that book's going to be because we know how he tells a story. I don't know, I think, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think it's going on. Anyway, I got another question from Eric and we'll make Stephen start this one. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> um, how intense do your outlines get or do you outline? Yes and no. Uh, to both of those, actually. Um, my first book, I didn't outline at all. And my second, I wrote a 30 page outline of everything from the start all the way through. And then um, the third and pretty much on, uh, I've had like a rough idea of something and just wrote, wrote down some, uh, some beats. And I think all of them are valuable. Um, even even uh, scrawling something on the back of a napkin of, of like your main idea, uh, I think is, is useful and counts as an outline. It's a map, just something to kind of direct you and keep you moving forward. So when you start to go off in a direction and go, hang on, and you look over at the outline and go, oh no, I wanted this to happen here. And sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the map isn't gonna match the train. So you end up having, you not having, but you end up going back to the outline and either making changes there, making notes or, or whatever to match what you're actually writing. You know, you may come up with a new character, a new scene, a new plot point, and don't, I don't, I don't think you want to be so rigid with the outline that you cannot explore that. Because if those ideas are coming up, they're coming up for a reason. And you want to be able to take them and run with them. Um, but no matter what you do as an outline, um, I, I just think it's a really valuable tool. You know, I'll, I, I just, I, I'll forget halfway through what the hell I'm supposed to do, like what I, what I had in mind for an ending or for a particular chunk of the book. Um, and just looking over at, I've got a whiteboard that's got like five points on it for an entire book, um, and go, oh, okay, there, I'm good there. So yes, sometimes they're intense. No, sometimes they're not. Yes, sometimes they're useful. And oh yeah, yes, they're, they're, they're always useful. <laughs> and that's it. Fonda? I'll just Thoughts? add that, yeah, I, I often hear this, right? The, I'm sure we all do, right? The like dichotomy of like pantsers versus quarters, mm -hmm. which um, I think is a really false one because yeah. I certainly think that the majority of um, experienced established authors, whether they start off being more of a plotter slash outliner versus not, eventually you learn tricks for, of both. Like you kind of have to because um, writing is this tightrope walk between like planning and spontaneity at all times. And um, an outline is a tool, right? It is one of many tools that you have in your toolkit as an author. Um, I do outline. I have outlined to various degrees of intensity depending on the project. Um, I have uh, almost always needed as an, as a writer to know how the story starts, how the story ends, and some of the main turning points in the narrative. And then I will flesh out stuff that happens in between some of those main points um, in an outline. I have then thrown out the entire outline and re-outlined in the middle of drafting. I have written an outline that I realized was dead on arrival and then had to, you know, scrap that. Um, I've gotten to points where 
it was useful for me to then backward outline because I knew where the ending was. And so I would start to outline backwards to try and chew away whatever was stalling me. So um, I, I don't think there is a, you know, one size fits all solution either to um, writers as to whether to outline or not, but even to you individually as to whether to outline on one given project um, or not, and or how intensely to outline. Um, so so um, the answer is uh, yes, but for me, the outline is more than anything, a way to gather enough courage that I can jump into the swimming pool of writing and absolutely knowing that it's going to change and that I'm not beholden to it. Um, yeah, I love what you said about uh, the tightrope because it feels like one that I'm, I'm constantly trying to walk and sometimes not very successfully, but I think it's very true that most writers are both plotters and pantsers. Like I think most of us are somewhere in, in between. I don't feel like there are actually that many people who are extremely one or extremely, extremely the other, although they certainly exist. But um, yeah, I think um, I also like utilizing the, the backwards outline or the reverse outline. I think especially when you're writing, you know, a whole book, there's so much that you have to keep in your head. And I know for me, there's always a point where it feels like I actually cannot hold the entire book in my head. So I kind of have to go back and do, you know, what you do in a lot of um, like mystery stories where there's, there are always those scenes where we have to stop and say like, okay, well, let's let's go over what we know let's think about what we what we need let's you know and so I think like it's always valuable for me to do that uh, especially during a big book project like to go back and say like okay what are the pieces I actually have in place what has changed what is maybe a little bit different and what do I need to go back and fix or fill in um, and that process I think is always very illuminating no matter what stage of the project you're at um, for me since I do tend to start with character I usually know you know, what the basic arc is or what I think the arc is. Sometimes I'm wrong, um, but that kind of helps me guide into like, okay, what, you know, remember I said plot, I don't know her. Like that is what helps me guide into like, what is the actual plot of this book? And for my original works, I outlined to varying degrees. Um, it has really has been different for every book. Sometimes I've been very detailed. Sometimes I just know sort of big, you know, goalpost moments and I build off of that. Um, and of course, always try to leave room for change. I do think the one, uh, the one place where you do need to outline in a fairly detailed manner is when you are writing something licensed. Um, because usually those stories have to go through many, many levels of approvals from many, many different people. I like that I see everyone nodding here. Um, and so, you know, they want to know what you're going to do with their precious, lovely characters. And, you know, they should want to know that. You aren't probably going to go up and do something that's total chaos unless that's what they ask for. Um, so in those cases, those, uh, those stories, I find, do have to be outlined very heavily because they have to be approved by so many different people at so many different steps. Although even then, um, I have had, you know, like with Shadow of the Batgirl, we did have a very intense outline that had been, you know, approved and gone through and re-gone through by both me and the editor and many different people. And there were still things throughout the writing process where we noticed like, oh, actually, in execution, the pacing is a little slack here. Like maybe we need to change some, thing, some things up or, you know, this character, whatever this character arc maybe isn't singing the way that it's supposed to because of course your outline is different than your actual draft. And sometimes you will notice that you have things that read so wonderfully and hit so hard in the outline form and they don't really work in the actual draft. Um, so then you might have to go back and revisit. But I think like these are all good skills to have, you know, outlining, not outlining, leaving room, being really structured. Um, they're all just like, you know, as I think Fonda said, these are all like tools for what you are doing. Greg? You know, every time you say my name, it sounds like a grunt. So I have to pause and say like, <laughs> Greg. Um, <clears throat> I'll just, I'll just say that so much of writing is figuring out your own psychology and how your own storytelling brain works. And you're not going to know that right off. And you can pick like pantsing or outlining one or the other. It's really important to try to figure out which works best for you or what combination works best for you. But if you don't have a deadline, you have the luxury of trying different things. So start off with an outline. And if you get stuck and you can't finish that book, then say maybe being improvisational is what's gonna work for me. If you're being improvisational, 
and you get stuck and lost and say, maybe an outline is what's going to work for me. Um, you're not going to know the answer to that question of what works for you until you've tried and failed a number of times. So that's just part of the growth of becoming a writer. Um, I'm going to put you this name, but I think it's Helmut von Mulkey, the elder, the German war general guy said that um, basically no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. So no matter what, a t what approach you're taking, it might have to change somewhere in the course of working on that project. And that's okay. I, yeah. I got uh, uh, my first book, my agent read it and said, I really think this one scene needs to be sooner. And I went, sure, no problem. And took it and wrote it sooner and realized that that cascaded all the way out through the rest of the book and changed everything. So I basically had to rewrite everything. So I'm freaking out and <laughs> it says, okay, write an outline, change things in the outline. And then when you, when you're solid and you're confident that this is the direction you want to take it, then start writing. And it helped because I was able to move things around and delete things and add things. All right. Um, I think I was gonna throw, I think Steven got the last question about outlining. So I'm gonna throw the next one to Sarah to start. Um, and that is an uh, anonymous question. When did you know you'd made it as a writer? Was it selling a book or a contract or cashing a check or meeting someone? Was it a specific moment? <laughs> Um, my favorite part of this question is everyone's expression. <laughs> right after you asked it, I really hope that this, this is where the whole panel throws our heads back like, and laughs uproariously. Made it? I, I really, <laughs> made it. I really hope someone like freeze frames that moment or something. I think <laughs> that would really answer the question more than anything we say could. Um, you know, I think like probably when someone asks me like, what is this sort of greatest fallacy of the professional writing career? I always say it's that you only have to break in once um, because uh, a long-term writing career is a series of sort of breaking in and leveling up over and over and over again. So as soon as you have reached one level of what might seem like, you know, made it, there is always another one. <laughs> and there are usually many that are stretching before us like a giant endless staircase. But um, that's why I also think it's important to celebrate each and every one of those milestones. You know, I had a friend who, um, she debuted a couple years before me and I remember going to her book party and it was really exciting. And like, you know, they had like so many copies, they were like sold out of them. Um, it was awesome. But one of the best parts that I remember from her talk is um, she mentioned that when she went out on sub with that book, like every, basically every step of that book, she would open a bottle of champagne and it didn't matter if it was bad or good. It was just sort of like a marker. So, you know, I think it was like the book went on sub, the book went out on sub and she opened a bottle of champagne and then the book got rejected everywhere. So she opened another one and then it went out on sub again. So she opened another one. And she said, by the time she was done, by the time the book had come out, she had this big bag of champagne corks that sort of documented the journey of the book. And I thought that was really cool because it was sort of like, even if a step seems like a failure, it is still, you know, in a different arena than perhaps you were before. And it kind of can show you how far you've come. So I think for me, um, you know, it's been a series of, of different made it's like certainly, you know, finishing a book, getting an agent, going on submission, selling the book, all of these felt like amazing sort of level up, you know, made it type steps. And I guess for me, like one of the things that um, has really struck me is because, you know, like a lot of genre writers, I certainly came out of fandom. I was a huge fan of all the kinds of writing that I now do. And um, so to see things like, you know, I've had people cosplay as my characters or, um, like someone made me um, the t-shirt that one of the protagonists of Heroin Complex wears on the cover of the first book. Um, or like uh, some people have sent me fan art or, you know, things like that, which are sort of like ways that um, people particularly passionately like engage with works that they love and, you know, things that I certainly remember doing when I was engaging with those works that I love. So to me, I think those are 
perhaps the steps that I take the most joy in just because they speak to such a passion, you know, of the readers that I, as a reader and as a fan of things, certainly share. Um, so that is my very unwieldy answer to that question. It was kind of an unwieldy question. <laughs> Greg, have you made it? Oh, yeah. No, I made it. I, I've, I've drunk so much champagne. Uh, I've just got barrels of corks. No, of course I haven't made it. Um, I, did, I don't really have anything to add to Sarah's answer, uh, except for I really, really like the celebrate every step of the way. There's so much stuff that's going to kind of knock you down, um, including humans, but uh, nobody can rob that feeling of accomplishment uh, from you, whether it's like um, you make the New York Times bestseller list, which I've never done, or you've received a rejection, which I've done plenty of, drink the champagne or other non-alcoholic beverage. But you should say which you you haven't done yet. That is still a step that is, you know, perhaps in your future. Sure, sure. And, More and, champagne corks for you for you to. to <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, Fonda, either of you want to. I mean, I'm just a little bit that? leery of the whole uh, champagne advice because I feel like we're, you know, it's just going to lead to outright alcoholism. Like <laughs> if you're not in rehab. Honestly. Oh, rejection? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I drank that much, I thought my liver would be all I think, I think perhaps years ago. The, the footnote advice is do not drink the whole bottle yourself. Right, that, that makes do sense. Do not do in, what in we do. Thing, <laughs> like, don't, maybe don't do that, but, you know, find whatever your champagne cork is and go with that. That is very yeah. responsible <laughs> advice. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely echo everything that um, Sarah and Greg already said. Uh, but you know, the thing about this career is that there isn't—it's not there's no job security, right? It's not like I made it because I got a medical degree and now, like you know, I'm a doctor forever. Like that doesn't—it doesn't work like that in our field. There's um, very many different paths that writers take, and different goals. So what looks like making it to one writer may be completely different for someone else. I mean, someone may, their goal may be, you know, to see something that they write, reach a certain audience that's going to really mean something to them. Someone else's goal might be to win an award. Someone else's goal might be get a fan art. Someone else's is to like make a living that they can write full time. So everyone's made it is going to be different. And because we are also now all publicly inundated with social media, you're always seeing other people's successes. And that can take a toll on you as a writer because you're always tempted to compare, right? What you've achieved and where you're going versus what someone else has done. And it's, there's no career, everyone's on a different path. So you can't do that and maintain your sanity. Um, and you know, you'll have people that you think have absolutely made it, but then their series gets canceled and they're, they have a fallow period for a few years. You see people who write without, you know, just getting rejection after rejection. And then their 10th book is like a go to auction, six figure immediate bestseller. So you just don't know. And, um, and you, you know, absolutely you have to kind of just keep in mind what your goals are, what you're working towards without letting it burden you and feeling like, oh, if I, once I get the agent, I'll have made it. Once I get the deal, I'll have made it. Once I write the next book, I'll have made it. You know, every time you think you've made it, you will find something else um, that will make you feel like you haven't made it yet. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't, I don't think I, I've really thought about it as making it or not making it, but more trying to figure out what my definition of success is kind of what Fonda was saying about you know everybody's got their own path they've, they've got their own goals making it looks different to everybody um, and simply um, what my idea of success um, keeps changing you know I have like okay great I wrote a book okay next step you know, agent, publish, etc. good reviews, whatever. Um, so I, I don't really see it. I, I've never really thought of it as, as making it or not making it. It's funny. I had a, I had a friend tell me at one point, uh, she did a travel show and her big goal for success was she, she wanted to be able to walk into Target and not worry about what something costs. She's like, no more fancy, just Target. 
if I can shop in Target and not be worried about mm, how much is this? And I thought that's a great definition of, of making it. <laughs> it's but, it's a pretty high bar. It's I mean, yeah, I'm and like, I don't I'm not <laughs> being sarcastic there or anything. No, right? I I am now dreaming of all the things that I could buy at Target if I really <laughs> wanted to. <laughs> like maybe I will adapt your friend's uh definition for myself. Um but yeah, I mean, I think another thing like which I is kind of like coming out in these responses is also one thing I sometimes find valuable, especially since you're always looking at like, what is the next step? What is the next level? What's mm -hmm. the next champagne cork or stare that I, you know, I have to keep ascending is that sometimes you do have to go back and remind yourself of all the made it steps you have already accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, like sometimes I do have to kind of stop because like Fonda was talking about social media makes it so you were seeing kind of everyone's highlight reel you are not seeing the depressive spirals in our group texts like you are seeing kind of everyone's greatest hits and I, sometimes that can feel like oh everybody is making it except for me um so I do like to sometimes go back to basics and remind myself you know what, you sold a book. Like, remember when you did not think that was possible, you even sold three of them at once and then you sold three more, you know, like you kind of have to sometimes take it back to like, okay, so I did accomplish whatever that level was. I did, you know, get to the, whatever that level of is making it. And that's pretty cool. Um, and hopefully I can take that energy into whatever the next steps are. Um, but it is, I think so easy to get into that, you know, whatever that spiral is, or at least it is for me, that I do find it valuable to sometimes go back and be like, hey, you did, you know, make it in the in these sort of goals or like these sort of things that you wanted or things that you didn't even expect. But if you just, if you get down to it, finishing and selling a book is still a pretty big deal. Yeah, actually just finishing a book is a mm -hmm. pretty yeah, big deal. It's a huge I deal. Never sold my first book, but it, like finishing that was one of my biggest accomplishments so far in my career. That's a huge step. Yeah. I, someone told me once that, what is it, one out of a hundred people who call themselves writers actually finish the first draft of a book. So right there, if you've done your first draft, you've you've kind of made it. Yeah, because it's hard. You're, you're, you did you're a one hard. percenter right there. Yeah. <laughs> so what do I got next? Uh, I heard start with action for years, but now I see people saying don't start with action. Which is it? I have, Greg, you could take a stab at this to start if you like. Oh, okay. Well, thoughts. yeah, again, there's, there's no right answer. I think I prefer writing advice that's descriptive, describing things you can do rather than prescriptive things you must or must not do. That being said, starting with action, the problem is, is that it usually in the action is stuff we care about because it's happening to a character we care about. And if you start off with action, we have no reason to care about that character. We know nothing about them. We don't know whether we want them to succeed or not. So that's where I tend to go. But I know that there are plenty of books that start with amazing action sequences, just like there are movies that start with amazing action sequences. And if you've got the writing to handle the pyrotechnics and make me care because it's pyrotechnic and you're using great verbs, then by all means, do it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And um, I would say my, I've, I've taught classes in writing fight scenes and my general advice is um, write fight scenes and action scenes are meaningful to the reader and the audience because you're worried about the characters. I mean, if you walk down the street and you see two random people having a fist fight on the street corner, you might be momentarily distracted. You might be like, what the heck is going on there, right? But like, that does not make an impact on you the way it would is if you saw, you know, someone attacking your brother. Right? Like the, the emotional impact is just so much higher when you're, when you're invested. Um, so my, uh, again, you know, there's, there's it's no one shoe fits all when it comes to writing, but I um, generally go with the advice of, of not starting with action. At the same time, there are times when starting with action is fine because, you know, you look at a movie like Avengers Endgame, it can start with action right off the bat, right? Because we know these characters, you've already watched them in like 10 other movies. Like you don't need to explain who Iron Man is, right? So they can plop you right in the middle of an action scene because people have history with those characters. So um, 
so I think it's 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 a matter of like, have you earned that action scene? An action scene is like, you know, high power explosive. You want to use it when in, when it's going to do something for your story. So is that the best use of it, right, at the beginning? And maybe the answer is yes. I'd say more of the time it's no. Um, yeah, I, I would say it really, it's one of those things that really depends on what the story is, you know, it, it's, I think like, sometimes I know the urge is, um, and I think we talked about this a little bit um, before, but I think sometimes there's this urge to almost math storytelling, like if I do X, Y, and Z, or if I follow these rules, or if I follow these do's and don'ts, it would be perfect. And a lot of times it's more looking at the story and the characters and you know, what they demand. I mean, I, I have certainly heard over and over again, never write a prologue. One of my books has prologue. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, at the time I was like, oh, can I even do this? Like there's all this, everyone hates all prologues for all time, no way. And then I, I kind of talked it over with my editor and we were like, for this book, this prologue works. This prologue is the best way to kind of introduce the character and get you into what this story is. Uh, but that really varies from story to story. You know, like with uh, the Heroin Complex series, I almost went in a, you know, like sort of the opposite direction of, of what uh, Fonda was talking about with like earning certain things and figuring out when you can do them and so on and so forth. Because the first heroin book, I think I did have that in my head of like, you have to start with some big set piece action scene. You know, I think at the time also there was kind of that trend in television where you start with like this big bombastic scene and then it cuts, you know, five hours earlier, or 24 hours earlier, a week earlier, whatever. Um, that has become something that I think people now frown on a little bit because they're like, okay, too many shows have done that. Um, but I tried to make it an action scene that shows you the relationship between the two main characters. So it's like, this one is the boss, this one is the assistant, this is how they communicate with each other, this is how they communicate with each other when they're in the heat of battle. And, you know, I, I do remember that first chapter was probably the thing I have, I rewrote the most in that whole entire series. Um, but for the most part, I do think it still works. But then once I got to um, the, the most current book, which, which is the fifth book in the series, I was like, you know what? I feel like at this point I have earned the right to start with something softer. You know, we know these characters now, we can sort of watch them in a very mundane moment and the readers of the series will still go along with that because they know the action is coming later. Um, so the first scene of the fifth book is someone waking up and being horrified that she slept in because she never sleeps in and there's kind of this whole thing around that and then the scene ends with her just going back to sleep and that is not something I ever would have attempted uh, in the first book of a series but by the since we are in the fifth one now it felt like okay like I've earned this sort of soft quiet moment of someone going back to sleep. Yeah I I with everybody else here, I, I don't think there's there's a right answer. You know, it really depends on uh, on what the story is and what you think works. You know, there's and it's and everybody's going to have a different view on it. So you may write something, and go this, yeah, open with action. I open with action. I love it. It's great. Hand it to somebody else, they go, eh, maybe not. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just something that you have to decide for yourself uh what you want to do is is that the kind of story you want to tell is it not and it's just uh it's a personal preference i think i think a great place to open with action is if you have a character for whom action is a major part of their life so let's say you have a character who's a firefighter it would make a ton of sense to open with that person in in a fighting a fire right like um that there is a, a great time when you should open with action. And I write a lot of books that are very action heavy. Um, and the, what I generally default to is not opening with action, but opening with the promise of action. So you've, you've got a character who, or you open in a way that makes it clear, okay, just hang on with me. There's gonna be action soon. You know, I, I, something I was, I was thinking about recently uh, about this was um, and you're commenting about, you know, if it's a firefighter, it makes sense to open with action. Um, we have this idea of, well, you don't care about the characters, you don't have a context for them. Um, but if you can wrap the context 
into the scene as action. And so you, you actually, you learn who the character is through that. And I think, Sarah, you were kind of touching on that as well, a little, um, then I think it works. And uh, this is, that kind of question makes me think about the, um, if they're really asking the right question, like every scene needs to do something. It needs to, whether it's an open, whether it's an ending, whatever. And I think the better question is, what am I trying to do with this opening scene? Is this something that I want to do with action or not and why? And, and make sure that you can actually, that it actually works. I think that's that's a great point because I know whenever I hear the start with action thing, I always wonder that it's being misunderstood that I think people hear start with action and think we need a dinosaur attack or robots well, yeah. smashing through a wall or yeah, something. Yeah, everybody needs a dinosaur attack, oh, come on. First page one, yeah. But but I've always told people to start with action just means start with something happening. You know, we don't want to start with someone doing, you know, data entry for two pages at their job and nothing else. You know, we want that, we want to start with a moment of something happening to them, anything, even if it's just, God damn it, you know, Linda ate my lunch again out of the, the, the work refrigerator. But, but not waking up from a dream. I'm going to put my oh, foot down God. on that. <laughs> Actually, I, I, had, I used to read for, I used to read for screenplay contests a lot. And I remember I was interviewing a contest director at one point for an article. And she told me if we disqualified every script that began with someone finishing their novel, like on page one, she's like, we would probably throw a third of our entries out right there. <laughs> so, um, I got another one here. Uh, this is from Dan. This is actually an older one. Uh, well, not quite about publishing. Lockdown has fried my brain and kept me feeling unable to focus on writing. Do you have any advice on how to maintain focus when it feels like the world is falling apart around you? No. Steven, you're an expert <laughs> on this. Not really. <laughs> um, actually, I've, I've found, and social media has helped me a lot with this keeping in touch with other writers and seeing what everybody else is going through and, and not so much, you know, sharing misery, but just, okay. Yeah. It's this actually is, this is a screwed up situation. I'm okay to think that. And it's helped me kind of be able to push it aside in order to work. Um, that said, I'm not getting, anything done nearly as much as I want or need to. Um, and everything does feel like it's, it's a slog. Um, but having, and I, I don't want to think of it, I, I mean, it's a support network, but having uh, friends and people who get it helps. You kind of see what everybody else is doing and it just, you know, that's, that's just been a big help for me. Fonda? Yeah, I mean, I, I got nothing. I, <laughs> it's hard, right? It's Hardcore hard narcotics. Hard for, for, for everyone. Uh, but I think creative work is something that requires a, a certain mind space that's, that's hard to find, right? Like you, you have to feel like you um, have the bandwidth in your brain to leave this world and, and go journey around and make stories. Um, and and that is, that's hard right now. So I think just even recognizing that, um, that, you know, that you know, you, it, it, it's gonna be difficult to be as productive, as relaxed, as imaginative um, as you expect of yourself um, is important. Um, and, and just having, um, to the extent that you can, uh, carving out like small goals for yourself, right? And 
And even if you're like, look, I'm going to get 500 words down today, you know, or whatever it is, like something that you, you can feel like you're moving along, you're still, ha you're still making progress, even if that progress is hard to come by, um, is important. But, uh, but as for any special like magic, like, <laughs> no, I, I, I think I'm muddling along around, you know, with everyone else. Greg, yeah. you've been quiet. Oh, um, right. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say just be, be gentle with yourself a lot of times regardless of the external situation when you're not being as productive as you want to be that can be accompanied by shame and self-loathing and uh, it can be depression triggering it is for me um, just be gentle with yourself it's okay if you it's okay to not write sometimes and if this is one of those times just forgive yourself be your best friend. Yeah, I would definitely echo all of that. I mean, everything that everyone else has said, I, I think like, for me, you know, one of the things that I had kind of taken pride in as a writer before was that sort of productivity trap. You know, I had a friend who once said to me, you're like, you're like the whack-a-mole. Like you get, if you get bonked down, you just kind of pop right back up and you can write anywhere and you can write fast. And, you know, all of these things that we sort of internalize is like, that means that's good. That means that I'm like a good productive writer and I'm also like a good person, you know, it's like that that trap of sort of tying your, your self-worth to something that you cannot always control. Um, and I think right now it is important to say to yourself, and this is important, has been important for me to say to myself is, this is not normal. This is not a normal time. We are experiencing a massive collective trauma that we are being forced to process as it's happening. That is not a normal situation um, and being creative and making the space to write and and produce is already a challenging task so I think like a lot of it for me was like like recognizing it like Greg said trying to be kinder to myself I have a really good therapist which has been very key during that this time but um, I also kind of had to recognize like to get yourself up to the, the sort of baseline of being okay to write or to create or whatever it is you're doing, it takes more effort right now. It takes more mental effort. It takes more physical effort. It takes more emotional effort. And so I just had to kind of like allow for that, allow for that time, allow for creating that space, which is going to be more difficult. Um, and, you know, these things don't necessarily magic like Fonda said there's no magic thing they don't like magically produce words but they at least help me get into a space where I feel like that's possible and I think also um, echoing something that was said before like having a little bit of that community you know like I do have like text threads where sometimes we do writing sprints or we just talk about how we can't write today or whatever it is and I think also that feeling of knowing that none of us are experiencing this alone as it is a collective trauma. It is also something we are all going through together um, has actually been helpful for me. I think that's actually a key thing we, uh, that we're going through it together. Cause I think probably one of the worst parts of this, this past year really has been that we're all isolated and like the internet chat groups, text groups help us stay connected, but there is just that, nagging feeling of being alone um which which is really weird because i know like my my partner is also a writer we went into lockdown and you couldn't really t tell because like this is what we always do we stay at home and right and yet there's still that that cre creeping in feeling of and now we never leave home ever ever um but yeah i think it is it, it's just adjusting to the fact that this is like like everyone else has said not normal and giving yourself a break over the fact that you're not functioning at 100 percent during not normal times um i have two questions left for us one i joked with about before because it's gigantic and we could probably just do another panel on it if wondercon wants us to so i'm going to give you the other question <laughs> um What's a piece of advice you wish someone had given to you, had given you when you started out as a writer? And I will probably tag on to that just from my own experience. 
or at least a piece of advice you got that you wish you'd listened to. Uh, so, and Fonda, you want to start? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's so much writing advice out there and like so many things that you, you'll hear and then not really internalize or understand until like later. Um, so things like, you know, don't read your Goodreads reviews. I could tell you that, but like, you're not going to listen to me, right? <laughs> you have to learn that for yourself. Um, but, you know, like of all the many things that could be said, you know, I think one thing that um, I would say that I wish I had internalized a little bit more at the time is that, um, you know, your, your debut is not the be all and end all of your career. Um, I think when you're starting out, you put a lot of pressure on um, getting that first book deal and like, you know, you, you're, you, all of your hopes and dreams are wrapped up on it. And it can be a remarkably stressful time. Um, and it can be a time that is confusing because uh, you will very likely have spent a, a long time, years, um, reaching for like that golden apple and the golden apple is publication, right? And um, once you hit that debut phase, there's a whole lot of stress and anxiety that comes with that, that um, may feel like a brick upside the head, right? Like all of a sudden, you know, the book is going out in the world, people are reading it, they're reviewing it, sometimes very favorably, sometimes not so favorably. All of a sudden people are, um, you're now, you know, expected to do all publicity and marketing and you may have publishing hiccups that, you know, you never anticipated. Your editor may leave, your publisher might fall. Like you just, you don't know. There's a lot of, of things that, um, that could happen and you may have a smooth, even when you have a very smooth publication experience. Um, the amount of expectation that you've placed on that first publication um, can be very high and it causes you a lot of anxiety. So um, when I first debuted, I was with a debut writers group that we had an online forum and it was just like a stress fest all the time, right? <laughs> People, there's so many things that you, I, I would say find other writers that, are, that have been through it, that are going through it um, in order to support you through it because a lot of people will not understand. They'll be like, well, this is a dream come true. Like this is what you've wanted for, you know, 20 years and it is, and yet it is hard. And writing the second book while launching the first book is very hard and um, turning, yourself from a, I wrote one book to now I need to write consistently to build a career out of this and write more books. That is a difficult transition. Um, and your, whether or not your first book does well or not, um, you know, whether it's, whether you have a good experience or not, like it's not uh, the be all and, and all of, of your career either. So, um, so keep that in mind is what I would say. Steven? Um, wow. <laughs> I'm thinking like, what, what have I actually paid attention to enough that I actually remember it? Um, <laughs> huh. You know, I had, I actually had something for a, a second there and it kind of, kind of fell out of my head, but, uh, kind of just to, to calm down, you know, it's, it's easy to get frazzled in, and I, it wasn't put that way, but more, look, there's nothing you can do besides the writing. You have no control over anything. You might think you do. The world might kind of poke at you to say, yeah, you can do this, right? That's bullshit. You're not, you can, you have control over the writing and it's for me it was easy to fall into the oh my god what do I do for marketing oh my god what do I do for this you know and <laughs> you know, none of it I don't want to say nothing I don't want to say nothing mattered because it's, a lot of things mattered very very much but it was getting so engrossed in trying to control everything and it simply 
not possible. You know, and uh, I, I wish I'd kind of paid more attention to that. Of okay, you know that you know, it would have saved would have saved me a lot of money on antacid. You know, just uh, just kind of keep it calm, do your work, and I still I still do it. You know, I think I think most of us do. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Sarah? <laughs> Sorry, that was Great my husband. Damn you. I hope the is doing a live stream. <laughs> I love it. There's a stranger in the back there. I love I love surprise cameos on virtual panels. It's like my favorite part of this. Um, yeah, I think like mine would sort of go hand in hand with what both Fonda and Steven said, which is I wish I had listened to the people who told me you must prioritize your mental health. Um, that is not something that I was very good at before I was published. And it is something that I am constantly trying to get better at. It's something that I have to really think about every day. It's something I have to make a practice every day. Um, you know, I think like my debut year, or I guess the, the year leading up to my debut year, I did get a therapist and I kind of thought like, okay, good. I took, I took care of that. I can cross it off the list. And, you know, as we were talking about earlier, there being no magic solution for certain things, just getting the therapist did not magically make me able to handle everything better or calm down. I do remember my debut year uh, along the lines of what Stephen was saying was the year I started carrying Tums in my purse. Um, that was just part of my arsenal. But, you know, I think that um, that has been a process of me learning that this is actually something that you have to think about. This is something that is part of giving you that space so that you can continue to create and you don't get sucked into those you know, spirals of what is everybody else doing? What, what is working for me? What is not working for me? What is the sort of, what is my perception of what is happening here? What do I have control over? What do I not have control over? Like all of those things. So I think like that is something I wish I had listened to. And that is something that I would beam out to, you know, debut writers is like, it is whatever that, whatever that looks like for you, whatever that means for you, it is important to prioritize that because any creative industry is very hard, is kind of designed to chew up and spit out all the creatives it can get its teeth into. And it's important to um, keep your mental health as something that is a priority, that is something that is just part of the whole creative process. Okay. Um. I guess I have a small cluster of small lessons that I finally learned how to connect the dots that I wish I'd learned before. Um, it starts with writer's block, that writer's block isn't the inability to write, it's just uh, the inability to write words and pages that you like, that you enjoy. It's not that you can't write, it's just that you're writing badly and nobody wants to do that and it's not fun. So the next part of that is don't get overwhelmed by the job. You're, not, you're never writing a novel. You're not even writing a chapter or a scene. When it comes down to it, you're writing sentences. You're writing words. So that's Anne Lamott's bird by bird uh, motto. So maybe you can't write a, a paragraph that you like. I bet you could write a word or a sentence or three words in conjunction that you like. And the next part of that is you have to learn to appreciate and enjoy writing even when it's becoming difficult. Because for me, that's the majority of the time. And also, writing, it sounds weird, writing is more than 99% writing and the other stuff, the getting published and being on panels and the bookstore visits and the signing the checks, that is a minuscule number of minutes that you will spend in your lifelong writing career. It's mostly writing. So as much as you can enjoy the actual seeing words appear on the page, I think the happier writer you'll be. And that is something I'm trying to internalize with every book and every day I write and get a therapist. It's really helpful. I think the big one for me that someone told me this ages ago and I, didn't, I really didn't grasp it until almost my fifth book is just to remember you're gonna get a second draft that I, I know when I started out, I would sit down and write the first draft. And even if I'd outlined, even no matter what type of outline I'd done, I would be second guessing myself. Like, like Greg was just saying, every paragraph 
every sentence, every page, I'd be second guessing and like, I'd be stressing over this and stressing over that. And eventually I finally got in my head out of your hands. The minute that first draft is done, they're gonna, you'll get a second. So that's me. Um, I think that's really all we've got. And I think we're pretty much out of time. Would everyone like to take that great end of panel minute and tell us what you're working on right now or what you got coming out next? Steven? Uh, yeah, I'm just I gonna have... go counterclockwise around my face. Oh, uh, you're, you're, yeah, okay. Um, I have <laughs> the sixth uh, book in the Eric Carter series, Noir Urban Fantasy, Necromancer in Los Angeles. It's very violent and sweary. I, I like to preface that so people know what they're getting into. Uh, yeah, and uh, I've, I've been part of a, uh, uh, a Los Angeles uh, anthology that just came out called Speculative Los Angeles uh, by Akashic Books that uh, I'm really proud to have uh, have a story in and I think everybody should get a copy because there are 13 other writers and they're all fantastic so that's me did you freeze Peter Fonda yeah oh, am I next <laughs> I think Peter did I for a second oh <laughs> um yeah I just uh handed in the third and final book in um, the Greenbone Saga, which is my um, epic urban fantasy, Asia-inspired gangster family saga that I've called um, The Godfather with Magic and Kung Fu, and that comes out later uh, this year. So now that uh, that is put off to bed, I am um, I'm excited to get into some new projects that aren't public yet. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Sarah, go on. Uh, um, yes, I have, I think, four things coming out this year. I have the uh, the hardcover of my Dr. Afra Star Wars audio drama book. It's basically just, you know, the script in a nice, beautiful hardcover uh, that comes out in April. Um, my new YA rom-com from Little Tokyo with Love comes out in May. Um, the fifth book in the Heroin Complex series, which is, again, my Asian American superheroine series, uh, Hollywood Heroine, that comes out in July. And I also wrote um, a, an Archie, like, middle grade book. Um, it's actually the second one. The first one came out last year. And that is called The Riverdale Diaries Starring Veronica. Um, and that comes out, I think, uh, near the end of the year. And it's basically, you know, the Archie kids in middle school being super adorable. Um, so those are, I think, the things I have for 2021. Greg? Uh, let's see. Um, July, I've got a new middle grade novel, Weird Kid, coming out. Um, it's about a kid who landed uh, to Earth as an alien shape shifting blob of goo. And on his first day of seventh grade, he starts losing his ability to hold his human shape. That's all I've got coming out because uh, I guess I'm lazy. <laughs> Sarah just made all of us feel lazy. No, yeah. no, no. Damn. Yeah, you did. No, no, no. I yeah, mean, accept you that. That is your this, burden. Like, you guys know how this works, too, is, like, one year it's, like, lots of things, and then, like, the, the next one, like, you're so burned out from doing all those things, it's, like, nothing. So, you know, it's, like, what we were talking about with, like, the, the feast, the famine, like, we all go through those stages for sure okay I'm glad we got a good lesson from just roasting sarah a little bit <laughs> <laughs> how many here have ever had four things coming out in the same year you i think i've maxed at three I, I had three things come out in a year one are we are we counting in but are we books. counting anthology no and stuff like that like no just like you know, no. big Just things. things like what Sarah was talking about. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. No, that's a lot. I, had, I had, I had three. I think also any writer who is able to put out a well, book in in 2020 or 2021, like literally any book, or even if it's just like a pamphlet, or even if it's just like a post-it that you like scribbled something on and then put on your front door, I feel like any writer who did that should get like. 
ten thousand medals or something. So. You know, you're not redeeming yourself out of this I'm one. Sorry, though. I'm trying. <laughs> I try to give everyone the the champagne. Everyone, I think, deserves champagne corks for all. That yeah. they want. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming and hanging out, despite technical glitches in the middle of this and uh everyone that's been the writer's coffee house uh really quick because we didn't do this uh you can find me at peter climbs on twitter peterclimbs.com uh reverse order greg where can we find you uh writing and snacks.com or greg van out on twitter you say it just like you spell it sarah um, I am Sarah Kuhn, just my name on Twitter, and Sarah Kuhn Books on Instagram because some annoying person took Sarah Kuhn <laughs> before I could. Um, and you can usually find me both of those places, especially if I'm supposed to be doing something else. Fonda? I'm uh, at FondaLee.com and Fonda J. Lee on Twitter. And Stephen? Uh, StephenBlackmore.com and uh, s blackmore on twitter and i am on twitter far more than i should be all right uh thank you all again for doing this uh this has been the writer's coffee house and for those of you watching thanks for watching and i hope you enjoy the rest of wondercon 2021 out <laughs>